Here we are. All right, viewers, thanks for tuning in. I'm uh, Captain Nick with Marine Max in St. Petersburg. You might know me from my YouTube videos. And um, beside me today is somebody that really doesn't need an introduction. If you if you bought a boat on the west coast of Florida, chances are uh, he taught you how to use it, whether, whether it was on YouTube or, um, or in person on delivery day. So Captain Keith Lake, what do you say? Hey, Nick. How's it going, man? Good afternoon. Doing pretty good, man. Not the nicest weather, but um, considering everything else going on right now, I'm just happy to be here. Happy to talk about some boots. This is um, Boating Tips Live with uh, with Marine Max Online. It's an all new segment. Just um, talk about the fun stuff in life, and that's, uh, that's what everybody cares about, which is boots. So, um, if you guys have any questions, drop a comment below. Of course, subscribe with us on all of our social media outlets. Outlets, whether it's right here on Facebook at Marine Max Leisure. Um, Instagram and YouTube, which is at Marine Max Online, and of course Twitter. I don't know if you guys tweet, which is just um, at Marine Max. So, uh, like I said, drop any quick comments or questions down below, and um, we're gonna have some fun. Um, today's episode is gonna be Welcome to Mer Boating Tips Live, and uh, we're gonna kick off the top boating tips for the boating season. So, uh, before we hop into that, Keith, um, why don't you give us a little bit of history, man? Did you just well, when did Ke when did Keith Lake wake up one day and say, hey? I'm going to be Captain Keith Lake with Marine Max Clearwater. Yeah, so this is going to tie into like a lot of things that Marine Max does um, as a as a whole and what we try to promote and, you know, the passion and the love of boating. But um, just a brief rundown. It started with me when I was a little kid. My granddad was a doctor and he had Wednesday afternoons open. And so I can remember ever since I was a little kid, that Wednesday afternoon, it was my time to go run over to his house. And there's a little lake up in Indiana, Lake Maxenhall. And it would just be me and him. We go out and catch bluegills and, and all that stuff. Um, then moved down here to Florida. Uh, fortunate enough, my folks got a place in Madeira Beach on the water and got a boat and then just started fishing and diving. And, um, you know, it's kept me out of trouble. You know, we'd go down to John's Pass and we'd spend all night snook fishing and just, you know, doing different things. Um, and then it just, you know, once it gets into your blood, but that time with me is, you know, when I was a little kid with spent with my granddad, you know, that's kind of like I want to do with my granddaughter, you know, right now, just let her get in there and build that passion up for it. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's awesome. So how about you? Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about. Um, grew up in Florida, so um, on water around here. Spent a good amount of time up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I uh, know some of you guys are watching up there. Probably a little cold up there. I don't know if there's still snow on the ground or not. But um, but yeah, but grew up in the charter fishing industry up there and um, just always out on the water. Spent my summers up there fishing and then my winters down here fishing. Just constantly out on the water always getting better, just kind of always feeding that passion. And then um, I came to Marine Max and, and man, I just wanted to put my foot in the door. I did. That's all I wanted. So um, everybody, okay. laughed, they'll, they'll call me a toilet scrubber, which um, I did start scrubbing toilets and uh, liked it. And then uh, they found out I had a captain's license and, and learned from some of the best captains in the business, like Captain Brad Schultz, of course. And um, Keith just learned how to run the bigger boots and, and then pretty much how I got here right now is, you know, being able to provide that with other families is, is really special. Cause like you talk about, I want to make those memories for your daughter and um, doing an orientation or whatever and, and seeing somebody's face for the first time they see the boot and um, you know, that kid's life is going to be changed forever. So that's, um, that's kind of what keeps me going. Yeah. So like you, what kind of charter fishing were you doing up there? Commercial fishing. So it was striped bass. It was striped bass. They come in, um, early June and um, it was mainly trolling when, when growing up, but I kind of switched over to live bait fishery um, towards the end there. And, and it's real seasonal. It's really seasonal. You know, the guys up there, they say you have 90 days to make 90% of your money. Whereas right. in Florida, you know, we, we don't get that because we're doing it year round. Just sometimes it's hotter than other times, but it's always, it's, it's a 12 month boating season and we are pretty fortunate, but up there it's, it's hot and heavy, every day counts, every fish counts, and um, and, and that's what makes it so intimate, really. Hey, uh, we can kind of jump back to this. I see Susie on here just asked a question. She said she bought a stern anchor uh, to assist in anchoring at the sandbar, but they're nervous. Uh, any recommendations? 
Well, I think you're the man on that, Keith. I've uh, I, I've seen you do your magic out at Bunce's past. So, uh, so, so, what are some major major takeaways there, Susie? It just kind of depends. I mean, I don't I don't know what size boat you've got or what you've got, but he's got a um, 19 SPX. What's that? She's got a C Ray 19 SPX. Oh, okay, customer yours. Yeah. All right. So you're gonna you know pull up to the beach and kind of circle around. You want to stick your bow out offshore away from the sand you want to drop your bow anchor in the water and then typically you want to have about five feet of anchor line out for every foot of water you're you're in and the depth of water so say you're out at Egmont or, or uh, Bunce's Pass or something you'll set that bow anchor down start backing your boat up towards the beach and at the same time you're going to be trimming up your outboard a little bit so it's you know it's not going to be hitting the skeg into the sand you want to stop and make sure that bow anchor is set. You want to make sure it's dug in real good. And then already have your stern anchor, the end of the line already tied off to a cleat on the back of your boat. So then you're going to be back in maybe two and a half, three foot of water. So it's going to be easy to step out and you can walk that stern anchor up to the sand and stick it in the ground. And then typically, if you can, if you have it tied off next to the side where your boarding ladder is, so that way, if you got, you know, current or something like that, you can just kind of use that stern line to pull yourself back out, you know, up to the boat. And then you can adjust the boat, too. If the tide comes in and it gets too deep, you know, you can let out a little line on the bow and pull your stern anchor up closer to shore. But you're always able to adjust it back and forth that way. Um, yes, don't, just just try it. Don't don't be there's, you know, it's, it's trial and error. The more you do it, the, the better you're going to get at it. Yeah, the, those places where the tide really rips, like we talk about Bunce's Pass, it's where we do a lot of getaways and stuff. Um, the tide and the current, it's intimidating. I get it, you know, especially yep. when you're, you're um, you know, you've got other boats around and stuff. But, you know, wouldn't you say with, with a little bit of confidence, you can use the tide and the current to your advantage almost as far as just knowing how and where to place your anchor and, um, and, yep. and just kind of doing it quickly? Yep, you've got to, I mean, have everything set and ready to go. But, yeah, absolutely. It's and Bunce's Pass is tough. Um, you can, if you plan in your day, you can look at the tide charts. There's, you can get, you know, through the the Navionics app, which I highly recommend. You should have on your phone. Your, if you got a chart plotter on your boat, you're gonna have tides on that. And there's tide apps too. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of figure out, you know, try to time it at a slack tide or or something like that to get in there when you're anchoring up, it might, you know, make it easier. Yeah, so I, I see we have a question here from Josh and, and Keith. You just brought up the um, the Navionics app. Um, I think that's one of the most versatile and useful tools. Um, I mean, it's what is it? It's twelve, thirteen bucks a year, and it, yep. it is definitely worth every penny. I mean, I've ran trips at Kila Rendezvous down to Captiva. Um, first time ever at South Seas, one hundred percent on Navionics app. Um, I know other guys that have gone to Bimini on the Navionics app, and it's you know, it's, it, it's always something good to back everything up on. And, you know, you're going to hop on all these different boats. They all have different electronics and stuff. But that one constant is right there on that app. And even with the auto routing, you really can't go wrong. I've learned to trust it quite a lot. What do you think? Absolutely. I've done routes through the Bahamas on the, doing the auto routing um, and all that. Plus, you know, you can leave tracks turned on on there. Um, yeah. our, scall our scalloping spots. I've got them on my phone. You know, there are the areas or tracks out of certain places and stuff like that. Because us, you know, at Marine Max, if we're doing a getaway. We're on a different boat. So it's not like I've got my chart plotter that's constantly there all the time, but I can have it all backed up right there on the Navionics app. Yeah. The other thing you want to do too with that Navionics app is go into the menu and go in and change the settings. You can change like on the Marine Max YouTube channel, there's boating tips videos in there. And when we're on the Ray Marine or the Simrad, they all use the Navionics platform. Mm -hmm. You'll notice I go in there and I'll change deep water. It's set up like default at like 60 feet. Go in and change that to six. Mm -hmm. But in the background on your chart, anything in the white is going to be six foot or deeper at low tide. So you keep your boat in that white shaded area on your, on your app and or on your chart plotter, you know, you're going to have plenty of water. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely fine tune it in quite a few different ways. I, um, and you can even tweak the, 
the the charts a little bit. Like there's a sonar chart, then there's the uh, there's a government chart. Um, I usually run mine on the uh, on a sonar chart just because I find that the contours show a little bit better. Just for like, for instance, when you're coming to Marine Max Clearwater on one of the charts, it doesn't show it all the way in there, where the other one will take you pretty much right to the dock. Um, with that being said, also, I have all my good fishing spots backed up on there. I mean, you never know, God forbid, uh, you, 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 lose a, you lose your bottom machine on your boat someday or you lose your GPS. You want those numbers. You probably work really hard to get them. You probably don't want other people to have them. So I back them all up right there. And, and especially if you're going on somebody else's boat, you've got those numbers all ready to go and, um, and really hone in on a fish. You can also set up your fuel burn and you know your your routes and so you're going to know exactly how much time it's going to take how much fuel you're going to burn and all that which is very useful you know absolutely all right judith i uh that's a good question there is there a good app that identifies public docking in different areas also good places to dock to eat um keith are you familiar with dock law i downloaded it probably two weeks ago because it was the only way that i could see the rates of a marina yep um, dock Doc was it all your big marinas are going to that. So like even if you were to call try to call St. Pete Municipal Marina and get a slip or a dock, they're gonna tell you to use the Docwa app. Oh, they yeah. don't take yeah. they don't do anything themselves. So yeah, Docwa's the the app for that. And then um there I just have here. There's uh these waterway guides are really good to have. I know it's you know it's not an app per se, or on your phone, but like if you're traveling through, let's say Lake Okeechobee, it's almost like a trip tick. It's going to break everything down by mile, basically, as you're going, uh, what's around, but then it's also got, you know, listed all the marinas, size boats they'll take, if they've got diesel, if they've got gas, if they've got laundry, if they got showers, restaurants, and all that stuff. So the, the waterway guides are a great great reference you know for and whether it's florida or the bahamas or new england i know on i know on a marine max app you can uh which marine max app's great by the way guys but that's not the point i know that you can schedule all your fuel and stuff like that can you do that on dock lot too like if you're going to a random marina can you can you schedule fuel or something like that or um, i'm not sure hmm. i know to show prices and stuff like that but i just i don't know because i i've never used it personally but i've uh i just kind of toyed around with it yeah. So, how about how about some icebreakers? I know uh, I know everybody watching is uh, probably experienced running aground before in Florida. I know I have. Um, Keith, I don't know about you, but uh, you know there's there's two types of people. You know, right? There's there's those that have run aground and, and those who have lied about it. Um, yep. So, uh, what's your take on it? What do you do? Have you ever done it? Um, is it anything to really be ashamed of or why? No, I mean, you're, it's going to happen. Eventually, you're going to run out of water. Um, I was just, uh, it was one of my first couple of years here at Marine Max. I was doing an orientation and uh, we're out here in the bay. We've got a boat ramp here. We put the boat in the water. It was like a little, it was a 19, 18, 19 foot boat. And we're running along. It was winter time and winter low tides. And um, which we can talk about the tides variations, but we're running along and the guy's driving the boat and there's all the ducks are up here in the wintertime and they're looking at the birds and I'm like, okay, we need to start turning now. I need to start turning now. And they just kind of kept going. All of a sudden we're you know, hard to ground <laughs> and it was winter. It was cold. So shut the engine off, trim it up. And it's like, okay, no problem guys. So I rolled my pants up. I jumped overboard, kind of pushed the boat around and got us pushed out into deeper water. And uh, we came back in and they were really, really, really nice people. And they were so upset. They're like, oh, my God, Captain Keith, we're so sorry, you know, and uh, we won't tell anybody. So, OK, don't worry about it. It's no problem. Well, Kyle Langman was working here at the time. And uh, so he's I just happened to be down on the docks. We pull in, we pull the boat up on the ramp. Well, the transom of the boat, the swim platform is just covered in sand and you know, <laughs> it all blew up. And so we came walking back in the showroom floor, showroom door here and lined up all the way across the front. All the sales guys were all standing there with their pants rolled up and everybody gave them like a standing ovation. And these people like look like, how do they know? We didn't tell anybody. But it was like the 
Uh, I found the sand on the back of the boat. But, um, yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing about down here with it being all that sand bottom. It's not like you're up in Maine or whatever with the rocks. I mean, for the most part, the only thing that's going to hurt is your ego. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. running around on a sandbar if you're going slow. But, you know, if you do, if it's hopefully it's low tide, you know, that's your best case scenario. So just wait it out. Put your anchor out. Stop, have a sandwich, drink a water, do something, hang out, wait for the tide to come in, and hopefully you got enough water to float yourself off. I definitely would recommend joining somebody like Cito. Um, it's AAA on the water. It's going to cost you like 165 bucks or something. That would quote me on the price, but for an annual, for a yearly serve service with them. Um, so no money will exchange hands. You run aground, you break down, you need gas. You need local information. Um, these passes here on the West Coast kind of, you know, move around a little bit. And, uh, you know, you can call one of your local CETO captains that are out there every day, and then they can kind of guide you in there, give you some good information on that. Yeah, for sure. Well, the nice part about running aground somewhere is chances are you'll only do it one time because you'll, uh, you'll, you'll slow it down a little bit next time. And, that, and that's another thing, like if you're going somewhere that, that you've never been before, especially, especially, especially at night, take it slow. You know what I mean? Take it slow, nice and easy. You know, I mean, that's when you see those mistakes made when, you know, you're overconfidently throttled down someplace you don't know where you're going. It's when you might be hanging out for a little while. Yeah. So. Um, Josh. Annarelli asked, uh, what's the favorite weather feature on your boat or favorite weather app for your phone? What are your, what are your go-to weather apps? I'm a WindFinder guy. Um, I know that there's a few good apps out there, but WindFinder, I've used it pretty religiously over the past few years. And um, here, let me pull it up right now. I'll kind of show you what it, what it looks like, but um, it's a free app. And you see right here, it'll kind of, it'll give you down to the hour or two. So it's saying today it's pretty windy. You see the rain on there, 20 over 20 knots. And I think that was pretty accurate today. It was honking tomorrow. Let's see. Going to be a little nicer day overcast, but um, it, it's, it's super in depth, you know, whether it's tides, it's got the wind direction, the wave direction and stuff like that. But um, I found it pretty reliable and, um, I mean, you can only trust the weather so much. I mean, a weatherman, I mean, they, they got the greatest job in the world. If they're, if they're right, they're doing their job. If they're wrong, you know, they're just still doing their job. Still getting paid. Um, but, but, I, but I have learned to trust this app pretty religiously. Um, and that's for the wind. As far as the lightning goes, there's this lightning tracker app. I know that we deal with that in Florida, especially in the summertime and, I know Josh likes this one, but it'll it'll track where the lightning strikes are. You see that that band kind of moves south of us right there. Um, I'd say it's it's a really important app for um, staying safe because the lightning can be pretty hit, pretty hairy situation, especially here in Florida um, in the summertime. So um, yeah, I learn to trust them a lot. What do you think? There's absolutely, there's another one too. It's, it's an app and, or it's a, it's just a website. You could bookmark. It's Ventusky, V-E-N-T-U-S-K-Y. And it'll just like those other apps, but it'll break it down by hour and you can see, you know, predicted, you know, it'll do your waves. It'll do your wind. It'll do, um, you know, like light all those different layers you can add or subtract to it. Um, it works really well. Like when Hurricane Irma came through, I mean, it was like the only one that really predicted the exact path she was going to take, you know, coming through here a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, it, at the end of the day, you do kind of need to, you need to use your better judgment. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're, if you're at the boat, I mean, especially in Florida in the summertime, how quickly it, I mean, it comes right out of nowhere. You know, if, if you see the clouds, you know what to look for, you might want to tone it down a little bit go out a little bit later or whatever, because sometimes even your apps might not be able to give you exactly what's going on. Yeah. So cool. So Keith, I got a question for you. If I can pick your brain a little bit, um, walk me through Captain Keith's perfect day on the water. 
from the time you wake up till the time you come back in, what's that look like <laughs> to you? There's uh, there's not one perfect day. I mean, there's there's different scenarios, right? You know, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah. So, I mean, a day I absolutely love, you know, with Kathy and I get on the boat with our granddaughter, Allie, you know, she's, she'll turn seven here in a few days. Um, hopefully, which is probably not going to be able to with the COVID going on right now, you know, get to see her, but love to take her fishing. Like I was talking about, you know, my time spent with my granddad fishing, I cherish. And uh, I mean, she just, she loves it, you know, with her little pink Barbie pole and, you know, just catching pinfish, keep them active. Right. Um, and then going to the beach, you know, and, and walking around and swimming and playing and all that. And then there's the days where you're going to go fishing with your buddies, right? I mean, you're, you're up and you're out at 5 a.m. You're 80 miles offshore at seven o'clock, you know, watching the sun come up and, you know, loading up on fish and coming back and one o'clock, you're back to the dock, you hit the pool and you're watching the football game, you know? I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's an awesome day right there. And then, you know, boating just with friends, right? You know, like don't even put a fishing rod on the boat. Just hop in the boat and go and go do your thing. Go to restaurants or go to the beach or something like that. And then there's the tournament fishing, which is a totally different game, um, which takes a lot of focus and preparation. And I just, I get like over psyched, over hyped, you know, I mean, it'll oh, be. Oh yeah, you lose a lot of sleep right? if, there's any, if there's any sleep at all. Yeah, I mean, you and I are in the same boat with that, right? We both kingfish some of these tournaments and stuff and and, uh, and watch. So what's your ideal day? It, it, I, I'm definitely in the same boat as you. It's um, a lot, th there's no perfect day. There's no universally perfect day on the water because for everybody that, that looks like something different. Um, a lot of people might want to go out, throw a rod, have some fun. Um, me, it, it's, it's, it's either or. If I'm fishing, that's it. My, my mission is to be out there and <laughs> catch as many fish as possible, as big as possible, and, um, and, and, and that's why I got up in the morning. However, if I'm not going to be fishing, I'm not even going to put a rod on the boat, you know what I mean? I'm going to be out there. I'm going to enjoy myself. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get stressed looking at kingfish skyrocket on other baits or um, tarpon that won't chew. You're just going to relax and enjoy the water. So um, not to say you can't go out and um, spend time with your family, um, you know, throw a rod over the side and just uh, see what bites. Dude, I will tell you, though, you always got to take a rod with you. There's a, like an outtake or a blooper or whatever. I was doing the uh, Ray Marine video series. We were over in Pompano last year and uh, we probably did 10 or 12 different segments with the Ray Marine. And uh, we were out there in our Boston Whaler 38 Outrage. And before we left the dock that morning, I asked Andy, I said, man, we got any rods? Should we take anything with us? And he's like, nah, we're, we're good. So we went out there and I'll be darned if we were running around. We're only a couple miles off the beach and all of a sudden you start seeing flying fish bait. And then all of a sudden there's just sailfish. They look like garbage bags and their sails are up. There's sailfish swimming all around the boat and we're just standing there watching them, you know, oh, guys. That, that's aggravating. But I um I used to fish with a guy up north here and there. And um, believe it or not, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't like to have everything ready. He wouldn't like to have everything prepared. And you'd ask him, you say, hey, why don't we do this? And he'd say, if everything's perfect, you won't get bit. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, uh, so that that's that. So, a couple see, other questions. Some of these questions over here. Yeah. What's your favorite or what's your go-to fishing report website? Um, from Dustin. Um, I don't have an actual website, but I will say. Some people swear by the so lunar charts, um, whether it's inshore or even offshore. Um, I mean, I used to fish for redfish with a guy, and, and I know a lot of the kingfish guys are pretty religious with it too. Um, I believe it. I, I, I do too. I do too. Um, it, exactly what science is behind it, I'm not going to try to understand it, but just you know the way to fish bite and stuff like that, um, I, I think that it definitely comes into play. Um, 
And at the very least, it's something to blame it on if you don't catch fish. Well, it was only on one fish day or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, do you have fish, an app? Fish Rules app. It's great to have here um, in Florida. Um, it'll have the picture of the fish, uh, the size limits, the, the bag limits, and all that stuff right there. So if you're, un you're unsure, which things change a lot, whether you're in state waters, federal waters, out 120, you know, the, the 10 fathom or the, what, 120 foot, mm -hmm. 20 fathom line, you know, whether or not, you know, we can keep fish, that fish rules app is real good to have. Mm, that's, that's a good one. I don't have it. All right. Time to ask some, uh, some marine elect answer some marine electronics questions. Uh, I know everybody's biased and, and, and a lot of times it's going to come down to preference. I'm going to say that I'm, I'm pretty partial to three brands. Um, that's your Simrad, your Raymarines, and, uh, and your Garmin's. I think that they all do a pretty great job. Um, you know, e each one is going to really take care of you. And, uh, you know, some will do things certain a little bit better than others. But for the most part, it's going to come down to preference. Um, did you have a preference, Keith? Um. No, actually, I was looking at another question over here. So, John Longley threw you a softball, dude. <laughs> oh, boy. When's the best time to buy a boat? When's the best time to buy a buy boat? A, to buy a used boat. Buy a used boat. I'd assume people mainly sell trade after the reality of ownership sets in. I think after a season, fall or winter would be the best time for a good buying lots of inventory choices. You know, it, 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 it's funny because you're talking about a curveball. It's like just when you think, oh, this is the best time to buy a boat, you'll see a steal come in on trade. And it's like, you know, every situation is just a little bit different. Um, I mean, generally speaking, that's a tough question to answer. I think you have me stuck there. I think it's a, I think it's a case by case basis. Um, you know, you do run into different situations though. So, you know, after the boating season's over, um, you know, at the end of the summer, you might see some people say, all right, that was our last season. Um, let's get rid of the boat or something like that. Um, but then on the flip side of that in the spring and everybody's upgrading boats, you see a lot of boats get traded in then. So I'd say generally speaking two times a year, the spring and the fall. From what I can tell, correct me if I'm wrong. And some, something else too that I've seen. I mean, I've been here for 18 years. Trust your sales consultant. Let them know what you're looking for. If we don't have something in stock right now, if because they're going to know, they get a sheet every single day of every boats that were traded in in the company before it even gets posted online or anywhere else. And a lot of these boats are sold before anybody even knows it. So. Mm -hmm if you're working with a guy and he's got your info and he's going to be able to see the pictures and talk to the person that took the boat in on trade. And he says, I got it. We got to do it. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Cause I guarantee you, I see it here every day. Somebody will come in to look at the boat and it's gone. Mm. So, so. I, I, I heard an interesting analogy the other day and you know, it's, well, this is, this is the first boat I've looked at. Um, everything's perfect, but I don't, I don't know if it's right for me. And it's like, you know, if you were looking for your keys and you found them in the first place that you looked for them, would you pick up your keys? Right. You know? Yep. But, but yeah, it's definitely a case by case basis. Trust your sales consultant for sure. Um, chances are they're, um, they're watching the market every single day before things come in on trade. Um, you know, if you are set on that used boat, you know, there, there is a little bit of urgency there. And, um, and who knows that deal might pop up, you know, it could happen tomorrow or it can happen six years, six months from now. But, um, I definitely got to put the feelers out there. Um, somebody asked, Kathy asked about cleaning strainers or filters and stuff like that. How often should you do that? Um, filters and strainers for like your air conditioner, your generator and all that stuff. I recommend at least monthly, um, you know, do it yourself. Marine Max offers monthly maintenance. The guys can come out and go through everything, go through your boat. Um, they've got a checklist of everything that they, they've done, especially if your boat's in, in warranty still, they can go through and get things before, you know, they get out of hand and stay on top of stuff. Um, 
or, you know, bare minimum, I mean, you're doing it yourself. Get in the bilge, look around, make sure it's dry, make sure things are clean, corrosion guard your connections um, and all that. And also flushing your engines out for all of us in salt water, religiously, you have to do that every single time you go out. Come home, then just takes 10 minutes. If you got an outboard, hook your hose up to it, turn the water on and let it go. I mean, and they make it so easy nowadays too. I mean, with the outboards, I mean, we, we are such a, a far cry away from the days of putting the earmuffs on, turning the water on, starting up your engine, waking up all your neighbors, making everybody mad. I mean, it's just as simple as what? Just there's an adapter on the engine, put the hose on it, uh, turn it on for a few minutes or whatever, drink a beer, who cares? And when you're done, you're ready to go. And it's the number one thing that you can do for preventative maintenance. Agreed. Uh, Dave Maggie a while ago asked recommendations on how to get sunscreen out of upholstery and off Ooh. the deck. Um, I don't know that answer, but we will be able to find someone around here somewhere. Let's get back to that one next week. Exactly. Sunscreen. Okay. All right, here's a good one. What is your go-to snack to bring on the boot? <laughs> uh, the hot and spicy okra pickles. And, a, <laughs> and, and uh, Publix chicken wings. Those are pretty yeah. good, too. They yeah. seem to work. The Publix chicken wings are good, and, and uh, fish like them, too. They do. I mean, good. They, you'll look up the videos. There's quite a few videos of people catching fish on tri chicken wings. Yeah, but uh, but no, yeah. I'd, I'd, say, I'd say beef jerky. Right. It's simple. It's clean. Um, it's a little too expensive, but I mean, I think that's everybody's go-to when they're uh, heading offshore or whatever. So, all right, Joshua Levine, thanks for thanks for tuning in. Do you guys ever take customers out on trips? Good question. Um, I mean, man, I've done some trips. Um, Keith, you mentioned the, the scalloping trip up in uh, Homosassa Crystal River earlier. Um, yep. the best time I ever had in my life, ever, 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 was down at South Seas for the Aquila Owners Rendezvous. Uh, I had the time of my life down there. Marine Max really does a great job as far as, you know, after the fact, having a good time, learning how to use your boat because – you are, you're, you're spending a good amount of money on a boot. You want to be able to use it. You want to be around like-minded individuals that have the same interests as you. So you're all going to pack up, go to a trip, whether it's, you know, up north to Omasasa, um, down south to South Seas, or, man, you've even done a few Bahamas trips, haven't you? I haven't been on the Bahamas trips yet. All I do is I, I route them out and all the sales guys get to go. So. <laughs> someday, but, someday. But, yeah, those trips, they're called getaways, right? So it's the get part of the getaways program. And so like the home Sassa or the, the crystal river trip, for example, um, people trailer their boats up there, the bigger boats, they just run them up on their own bottom, but we'll have a captain's meeting or dock tails, like on a Friday evening, you get to meet everybody. And then Saturday morning, nine o'clock crank up, I'll be up there in a boat, lead everybody out of the river, get out to where we're scalloping come back, everybody goes to dinner Sunday morning, we get up, do the same thing again, or you might want to go to the Springs. Um, there's just, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff to do out there, but yeah, all up and down. I mean, all the Marine Max stores do getaways, you know, whether you're at LOZ or, you know, you're in Miami or, or wherever. So, you know, all your, they're all, all different and do different, offer different things. Yeah. I mean, just, just kind of talking about on this coast, um, you know, I know that we're just talking about going up north or going down south or, you know, with the getaways and stuff. Um, one of the things that we are fortunate to have around here is the intracoastal system. Um, I mean, you know, all the way from Anklo down to Marco Island, um, you know, it, it, it provides such a great opportunity. You know, even if you're in those smaller boats, you're in those, uh, you're in those day boats, you're in those bow riders, you're in those, those, those 17 foot Boston Whaler Montauk. You know, you do have the option to just kind of cruise nice and easy without being in an open ocean. And, um, it, I mean, man, it is a great way to experience Florida at its core. You know what I mean? Just, you know, different bridges and stuff, you know, especially when you're making your way down through the ditch, it is, it's unique, you know, and it's, it's definitely a trip to be made and you don't need to have a, 
a super yacht to be doing it. Nope. Really. Nope. Throw a suitcase on your boat and go. Stay at a resort. Stay at hotels as you go. Your boat's right out the back door. And just go and do it. Yeah. So. Um, uh, so we, uh, we, we got the infamous question right there, Keith. I'm going to let you answer this and then. Uh, Talking about the overboard discharge? I'll let you answer that one, and then I'm going to answer the one about banana. Oh, banana. <laughs> um, Ryan, overboard discharge. So, state of Florida, you have to be nine miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, or you got to be three miles offshore in the Atlantic Ocean to overboard discharge. Um, when you get out offshore like that and you need to empty your head out, there's a seacock handle that's down in the bottom of the bilge that's actually zip tied shut. So you'd have to break the zip tie, open the handle up, then flip on the macerator switch. You're going to dump out into the water. Then when you're done, you'll close that handle off and then you want to zip tie that closed again. If the Coast Guard were to stop you inside the nine miles or inside the three with that valve open, you could technically accidentally overboard discharge by somebody going into the head or wherever the, the discharge switch is. So make sure you disable by closing it. I definitely recommend though, just wait. And when you get fuel at a marina or whatever, just have it pumped out. Most all your marinas now are all got pump out stations. That way you're not putting it into the environment and, and all that. But at an emergency situation or it's full and you are offshore, you do have the ability to do that. But try you know just try not to i mean i've even heard um i mean like you were saying you open up that seacock down below forget about it right you come in you get checked yep. seacock's open you're facing a pretty hefty fine aren't you even if you weren't discharging or anything yep. just having it open alone is is a pretty big no-no and -no. Yep. yep and they will def they definitely check i mean every boat i've been on that we've I've been stopped you know it's one of the first things they go for to look for. All right. Thanks, Keith. Could you bring bananas on a boat? So, uh, I say no. I say no. I second that. I say no. I, uh, and I, I'm going to catch a lot of heat from this. I'm going to catch a lot of heat from this in the comments. I am. Um, I mean, there's, I know guys that swear by bananas. Some people think bananas are good luck. Um, I've just seen it happen and maybe it's all up here. I bet you it is all up there. Maybe it's just coincidence. I mean, I've just, I've seen too many just strange little things happen. You open up the cooler, bam, banana. Um, who knows? Um, I know that there's three stories. So if you guys are ready for a little bit of story time, um, sit tight, get cozy. It's a rainy day outside. So, um, I think a little story time will do some people good. Um, I'm going to give the first story. Um, and all three of them go back to the, the ships in the 1700s. So first one, a little gruesome. Uh, you know, there's a ship, cargo ship, going across the Atlantic or Pacific or whatever. Who cares? Some ocean. And um, it's carrying bananas. And, you know, with bananas comes banana spiders. And banana spiders kill the whole crew. So what do you think is going through people's head? They find a boat. It's nothing but a boat full of bananas in a crew that's no longer alive. So, bananas, bad luck on a boat. What do you, you know the other two, right, Keith? Actually, I don't, so go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, two, banana boat. Might be this, it might be the same banana boat. It might be a different one. I don't know. Hopefully, they're not using the same boat. Um, banana boat. Runs aground, like we talk about, everybody does it, okay? Um, and, yeah, talking about the fumes, it runs aground. The, uh, all the gas from the bananas down below, you know, ferments, and somebody lights a match, and boom, ship explodes. So uh, that's one I've heard. And then the third one they talk about here in the comments right there, um, the bananas would go bad really fast, and uh, often a lot of those times – You'd have people trolling lines off the back of the boat on these big transatlantic jerseys, journeys or whatever. And, you know, those banana boats would be going faster than everybody else because the bananas would go bad. And uh, they'd be going a little bit too fast to catch fish. So uh, next thing you know, banana boats 
going fast through the water. They're the ones that don't catch a fish. And, um, and here we are today banning people from bringing bananas on the boat. There you have it. So that's the big three. And uh, you can check me on that. Can catch a lot of heat, but um, you won't find you won't find me bringing any bananas on board. I'll tell you that. So that's a good one. Parker, are bonita fish big? Well, they're a game fish, so yeah. <laughs> a little little step brothers reference there. A good bait. They are. They are. Strip the bellies, red snapper fishing, or grouper, oh, yeah. anything. So, all right. Ooh. Moving on here. Let's cover. Let's cover one subject um, just before we answer questions. Um, if you can nail it down to Keith, this is something I wanted to ask you for a while. If you can nail it down to one major advancement, right, in the past 10 years of boating, right? You know, you've done so many deliveries and orientations. What's the number one thing in technology in the boating world that you say has helped boaters more than anything else? Hmm. Probably a couple things, but the joystick docking integrated in with the electronics with the chart plotters as far as the the auto heading and the the um, go to waypoint and all that stuff how it's all integrated together i mean the joystick if you got a twin engine boat and you've got the joystick docking i mean it just takes all the stress out of out of docking and doing all that and then it's you know with the skyhook technology and uh you know going to your waypoints and electronics you know your chart plotters you know gosh i mean that's just leaps and bounds from what it was you know even 10 years ago i mean it changes constantly i mean with you know whether it's raymarine simrad um you know garmin you know there's constantly software updates and, and new versions of things coming out all the time so keep your electronics you know updated um and do all that and then two, just the outboard engine. I mean, or three, I guess. Mm. You know, what do you think about like these Mercury, the new V8s we got here? Oh. How much time you got? <laughs> we got a little bit. Um, I was always a Mercury fan, right? Yamaha uh, makes a great engine too. Um, when Mercury came out with this new V8, they did revolutionize the world of, of outboard engines. Um, and even after up going to Fond du Lac up in Wisconsin and really seeing how these engines are made, um, I mean, I'm, I can't tell you how impressed I am with the new V8s. Um, I was telling somebody earlier, I remember the first time I hopped on board a boat with the new naturally aspirated V8s. There were 300 Viratas. It was a Boston Whaler 25 hour age. Um, and our general manager let me take it out and um, took it for a quick hot lap out in Boca Ciega Bay. And, uh, and we're used to those, we're, we're used to those L sixes. We're used to those supercharged engines. We're used to hammering down the throttles, getting those RPMs up, supercharger kicks in and you're taking off. However, this was a little bit different. So cruising around 4,500 RPMs, you hit it, right? And that mid range on these engines will throw you in your seat. Um, I mean, you talk about torque, you talk about mid range and, um, and then, of course, you talk about fuel economy and stuff like that. Um, they knocked it out of the park, and that's going to be a platform that they're going to use for years and years and years to come. And um, and I think that there's some big plans on that platform, and uh, stay tuned. Yep. What do you think? I agree 100%. I love them. I mean, the old Verados were awesome, but, you know, these new, new ones are just incredible. They are. They are. So, all right. So, so how about this? Let's answer one more question and, um, and then we'll work on all the other questions until next week. So of course you can drop questions in these comments, even after we go live and we'll get to those next week too. We'll do the best to answer them all. Appreciate everybody answer or asking these questions. Um, yeah. It means the world. Um, 
gives us something to talk about or else uh, or else you'll listen to me talk about Mercury Outboards for the next two hours, which that's fine. I don't care, but um, it's, it's nice to switch it up a little bit. So uh, Jennifer Sinaway. Hi, Captain Nick. I have a question. What Boston Whaler model in size would you recommend for a family of six, half a family likes deep sea and competition fishing, and half a family like cruising and hanging out? And we lost Nick. So half the family likes deep sea fishing, competition fishing, and half the likes cruising and hanging at the sandbar. Uh, I guess any. Oh, you there? You back? Yeah, baby. <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to read your question there. Go, go ahead, Keith. Your favorite. Right, go, go, ahead. go ahead. Now go ahead. 33 outrage. Perfectly proportional, just enough bow to make it to the next wave, and a um, good amount of bass eating and storage, you know, where you're always going to feel comfortable and safe. But uh, but I, that's just my two cents, but I'm, I'm a little bit biased. So what do you think? That's a beautiful boat. I like that. Um, you also got like the 32 DC, you know, if you want to do a little more family stuff. It's got yeah. the lot of well in it and all that stuff. There's different configurations of that boat. Um there's uh but the 33 is hard to beat you know yeah so so that's that's my two cents right there all right captain keith pick one pick one I'm trying to see you i think we covered uh, what are your favorite fishing equipment manufacturers What you think, Shimano? I, I'm a Shimano guy. I am, um, but when it comes to offshore conventional equipment, um, you cannot beat the reliability of Penn. I, I'm biased to Penn, but I I like that reliability. I do. But inshore, I uh, I'm a big fan of Shimano Stratus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, golly. I mean, think about how long's that Penn Four Op been around. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you got guys, man. Don't get me wrong. I mean, these, these new thousand dollar, you know, seven hundred dollar reels are awesome. You know, these two speeds and stuff like that. You know, you're able to crank a grouper up from one hundred and fifty feet in about two seconds. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep up with the one thirteen H. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate everything. Appreciate you guys all joining us. Um, it's been an honor. So this is where you're going to catch us every single week. For the most part, unless things change, which we'll let you know, 3 o'clock Mondays, Boating Tips Live. We're going to have some fun. We're all going to we're gonna make it through this strange time together, and um, and we'll pop out on the other side, hopefully on the water somewhere. So uh, so what do you say, Keith? Help spread the word. Get some more people on here watching with us. So it was good. It was fun. It went by fast. So It did. So I looked down at my phone, and I was like, man, it's only 3.50. You know, we've only been talking for 20 minutes, and I'm like – Wait a minute. We, we started at three o'clock. <laughs> well, awesome, guys. Well, Keith, thanks, man. It's been a, it's always been a pleasure just kind of Absolutely, Nick. picking the brain of, you know, just an encyclopedia of boating knowledge. That's what I'm going to call it. So there you go. <laughs> thanks, bud. Thanks, man. See you guys next week. See y'all.